Welcome to another edition of Anglican on Scripture. This is episode 873. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 6th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican on Scripture, the ongoing saga of the Anglican Communion continues, and George and I get to cover it, and a lot more. We've got politics we get to talk about, we get to talk about uh, <clears throat> corrections we may or may not have to make, and other things. But George, how are you doing this week? Pretty good. We had a hurricane pass through yesterday. What? What, what was it called? Uh, came ashore. Uh, Debbie. Debbie. Uh, sister-in-law. <laughs> Both violent, <laughs> turbulent things. Uh Debbie came ashore. We got 12 inches of rain here. But fortunately, we're a uh, pretty high elevation for Florida, so everything drains down to the ocean. So we just have, I just have trees down in the yard and a lot of twigs, and I'm going to go have to rent a trailer from U-Haul and a chainsaw and cut up all the stuff. Lost a few shingles at the church, but uh, the power and the uh, Internet are still down at the office, so I'm filming from the house. Um, and there's no air conditioning in the church, so hopefully we'll get that fixed by Sunday. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as you know, I, I've traveled now from Madison. We're outside the Pittsburgh area for a couple of days visiting the kids. And I, when I record, I have to turn off the AC in the rig here because we want you to have a pleasant listening experience. <sighs> I'm sorry you have to look at our faces, but we can control the audio. We do that by uh, turning it off for ACs. And, um, so, uh, yeah, quick update. I'm in Pittsburgh. We're on our way to Maryland. And George just survived another Florida hurricane. And that's just part of living in Florida. I, I, I got used to it. I, I only lived there for four years. George, um, we've been asked to correct some stories. Uh, there was a complaint from the uh, Church of England about us saying that Rose Hudson Wilkes is a DEI in appointment. And... In my understanding of hearing liberals talk for the last six and a half years, DEI is good. It's very good. You would be honored to be a DEI person, uh, appointment. You were hired not because of your merits, but because of uh, people who have white fragility have decided to elevate your position so they would have less fragility. That's my understanding uh, from some liberal books I've read. Why does the CE uh, Church of England not want her to be a DEI appointment? I don't get this. Well, I, as you said, we, we received an uh, email from the head of communications expressing a disappointment with my characterization of uh, Bishop Hudson Bilks, Bishop Rose, as a DEI appointment and as a bat <laughs> crazy woman. And probably I should have not said bat <laughs> crazy woman. Uh, <laughs> Yes. I, it, just to keep on YouTube, I have to ble I have to bleep the part. But yeah, go on. <laughs> okay. Um, I had cited an article by Douglas Murray, who hmm. took her to who took Bishop Rose to task for her uh, racial identity politics and racial identity churchmanship. And I've known Bishop Rose. I met. I don't know her, but I met her about in 1999, I think it was, with the World Council of Churches meeting, assembly in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and I saw her speak. And she was then, as she is now, a very aggressive uh, advocate for racial identity and gender identity politics. Mm -hmm. um, so the Church of England uh, said it. You know. They were offended by my remarks, and I will stand by the characterization that her appointment was not based upon her intrinsic merit, but because she ticked a number of boxes, mm -hmm. that uh, she was the first minority woman bishop, I believe, uh, first African a background Jamaican minority woman bishop. And I disagree with her theology, but Perhaps I should have been more genteel and not use the phrase, get your bleep button out, bat crazy. Uh, now, and, and in fairness, we generally don't use that term. Um, and uh, I, 
I don't know how it got I thought it was appropriate, me. but I don't know. I'm not I, a good person. <laughs> generally, I bleep stuff like that, and it, it doesn't get it doesn't get by me because as fun as we like to have fun on the show, we do uh, try to, to show respect even to those who have different theological uh, backgrounds or teachings in their life. So uh, if you heard a lot of bleeps in the last uh, couple minutes, it's because of who we, we want to project ourselves as being is understanding uh, in this crazy world. Um, and you actually and, and the, confused what, the Douglas Murray and Charles Murray. Who's Charles Murray? Yes. And the, um, I've done it twice now. Uh, this was pointed out to me in my criticism of Bishop Rose. I cited Charles Murray. Charles Murray is an American sociologist who wrote the book, The Bell Curve. Mm -hmm. And if you're of Kevin's and my generation, this was the book of the 90s and yeah. the early part of the 20th century. He was a very prominent political talking head. Douglas Murray is the new generation. Murray is the deputy editor, assistant editor of The Spectator, and a very uh, prominent, uh, I think they call them social influencers these days. Um, so I... In my little small brain, I confuse. I can only call have one Murray in my head at one time, so I call Douglas and Charles Murray the same person. They're not. Er Irving O'Malley is a cop. I know. I get it. You just you, lots of uh, network connections that don't happen in our older brains. Uh, also, I wanted to point out uh, um, that we generally understand that first reports are usually wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I, my first experience was with, with the world, the attack in the World Trade Center. And uh, we've told you that for you know, the, the 12 years of this show, that first reports are usually wrong. And sometimes uh, Anglican and Unscripted will get caught up in that. We hear, hear first reports, and we hear a first report that's collaborated, and it collaborated again. We put in our brains, well, okay, this has been checked by other sources. We can report on it. Um, not so good when you're using English press like the BBC for your your uh, subjugation here, George. What happened with our 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 seventeen year old Welshman? Well, the the news reports we had and from outlets that we normally consider trustworthy identified the the seventeen year old uh, in the man who attacked a Taylor Swift children's dance party, subsequently killing three children and wounding nine. Uh, we identif I identified him as a Palestinian immigrant or Syrian immigrant of Muslim extraction. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that has shown that is not correct. Subsequent reports by the police say that he is a native Welshman. Oh, actually, he's a second generation Welshman born in Cardiff of Rwandan parents. Mm -hmm. Now, we have no news about the motive. We've had no pushback against the Telegraph report that he was known to the security services. 17-year-olds known to the security and are usually known for one thing, that he was radicalized at somehow or some way. And I don't mean as a Welsh nationalist. Um, but this, the, one of the problems we have with, I have, with government press reports, be it the police, the FBI, or various agencies, is it's like the Trump shooting. The government is hiding more than it's saying. And some of the things that it says, I don't believe. And this has raised criticism about us that we should not talk about anything until we have all the facts and until we can discuss it. And if that's the case, we still can't talk about the JFK assassination. Um, you know, because the Warren Commission said Lee Harvey Oswald did it, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says that the CIA did it. Tucker Carlson said the CIA did it. No, we're not going to open that door. No, I... But, you know, there have been claims that, uh, well, this is Russian disinformation. I'm sorry. The Russians have more things to do than get involved in this. And... It's sort of funny that the Russian ambassador to the UK has put out a statement, which we put on Anglican Inc., just to be naughty, which says she urges Britain to follow the rule of law and justice and not treat the white anti-immigrant protesters uh, on a different scale than they treat BLM protesters. So when you got the Russians holding you up for hypocrisy, you've got a problem. But... The thing is that there are people who say, you know, George and Kevin, you're part of the problem. 
you and Gavin Ashenden and Calvin Robinson and then sort of expand the circle, the Nigel Farages and the Tommy Robinsons, you right-wing troglodytes spread this false information and this inflames these poor, dumb, white, working-class people in Liverpool and Bolton and Middlesbrough and uh, all these labor strongholds to go out and attack immigrants. Well, I'm sorry, I don't believe people are that dumb. And I don't believe that their agency is totally manipulated by what we say. Our, I don't think we have any viewers in Middlesbrough or Bolton, maybe one or two in Leeds. But, you know, if our viewers rioted in England, that means little old ladies leaving the tea shop with their umbrellas and striking people. Uh, it doesn't mean burning up migrant hotels. The government, well, and here, beginning with Tony Blair 30 years ago, the government and, and both Labour and Conservatives have allowed unchecked migration into Britain, both legal and illegal. And the last time Britons had an influx of this many foreigners was during the Second World War, when half a million American troops were quartered at ba almost the same age groups of these young men that are coming across the channel, except th the Americans were under military discipline, and everybody knew that they were going to leave as soon as the war started and the invasion began. And even then, there was a great deal of tension between Americans and their bases and locals. Um, it was also a fact when the Americans were massing in Australia for the invasions of Japan and New Guinea and whatnot. So that many young men, even in the best of situations, is going to cause problems. But here we've got no end of the solution and the government saying, if you raise the issue, you're the problem. You're a right wing thug for wanting law and order and the England you used to have remain the England you had England that is it's gone. Well, you know, England is completely lost. We've covered before their lack of uh, free press. They have a lack of uh, free speech. Uh, people get arrested there all the time for offending people online. And as far as the new prime minister is concerned, the biggest threat is not immigration, it's not liberalism, it's not CRT. The biggest threat to Britain, in his own words, is social media. Um, is <laughs> yeah, And so he, he thinks, as long as I can get rid of that, if I can get rid of people's access to unscripted or access to Twitter, um, this country will, to, will run smoother and operate it better. And nothing can be further from the, the truth. The reason, you know, this is the fourth correction we've made in 873 episodes. I'm doing the math in my head. That's 0.3%. Point zero three, no, three percent. They get my zeros right. Point three percent. I mean, that, that's a low correction rate when you consider, like, the New York Times or any other uh, major publication. Well, we we have a very small correction rate on anything unscripted, but when we do have a correction, I make sure it's the first story. We, we're mm -hmm. going to come up here and because we're about transparency, and we yeah. want to model and for other journalists how you handle a correction, and. Um, yeah. And I, I, it's not that we're correcting my comments about Rose Hudson Wilkes. It's rather that um, they were not uh, said in a way that was a positive way. Well, and yeah, yeah. Well, I was correcting the Murray part, but okay. Oh, okay. Well, the Murray part, that's just <laughs> stupidity on my part. Uh, that, that's plain stupidity and just the ravages of age going through my head. But you know, the Church of England uh, really was offended by what I said. Mm -hmm. Now, and, but I don't walk back what I said. What I walk back is how I said it. Perhaps mm -hmm. there was a way to be more, uh, more in I, discreet in well, pointing out the woman's idiocy. I don't know. I mean, if you tell me for years and years, Church of England has told us this, that DEI is good then we should be praised for pointing out the DEI candidates. If it's mm -hmm. not good, then I need to change how I handle this and say, not good. And I, I, I don't know where to, to, 
to hand this over. So the Diocese of London has finally responded to George in kind by responding to everybody uh, about what's happening with the LLF and these special special ordination commissioning slash not really bishop. We're not going to lay no hands on nobody. So what's going on there? Yeah. Last week, uh, the uh, press office for the Church of England, uh, Luther Pendragon uh, press, uh, press uh, PR firm, sent an email to me and to, uh, sent it to Julian Mann, to the Church Times, and some religious publications. And, but they didn't put it on their website, and we, I put, we put the whole thing up on our website. And basically, this was in response to the commissioning service at St. Helens Bishop's Gate. Um, when people want to know, what's the church, what is the Diocese of London going to do with this direct poke in the eye from the conservatives? The answer is nothing. They're not going to do anything. They're going to basically say, let's just respect the LLF process let's uh, let's follow the canons so this is uh if you were a radical conservative this is a free license to keep on at it because there's no downside so far. well this to me is the pure definition of an english civil war within the church the very nice 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 rebel alliance says we're just going to form a little group here and not go radical we're not going to confirm nobody or baptize anybody or anything like that we're not going to ordain anybody don't get silly don't we're not not radical and then there's the the nice diocese of london says well if they're not going to do anything really bad we're not going to really go down hard on them we're just going to sit back and see what happens and there you go that english civil war george yeah well, sit back and wait. There's been another. The the left has jumped in on this from a really, uh, I don't want to say hypocritical angle, but uh, uh, sort of a pot calling the kettle black. The liberal Anglo Catholics have chimed in saying, "Oh, it's the end of the world. It's the end of Anglican theology if you have ministers who have not had the hands of a bishop laid on them celebrating Holy Communion." then that Holy Communion is false, and those people who think they're receiving the sacraments aren't receiving the sacraments, they're all going to go to hell. And it's funny to me that these are the same people who are pushing gay marriage. And now the Bible actually says nothing about how to celebrate Holy Communion, but it says a great deal about marriage. They're happy to junk marriage to rewrite it for their liking, whereas Holy Communion has to be, you know, according to these norms, set out. Um, now, I don't want to get into the lay celebration of the Eucharist controversy. There are people from Sydney and some English evangelicals who are more on the ball about this. But sometimes you really have to uh, be... The lack of self-awareness from the left on this is, is appalling to me. Well, in recent politics in England, I'm not that surprised by the absolute hypocrisy going on there let's go back to the parish olympics uh clearly a blasphemy against the uh, eucharist uh we finally have some responses from the vatican and some overseas anglicans uh let's start with uh, pakistan and nigeria because they have the most to lose well pakistan nigeria and some other developing world provinces have written very stern public letters denouncing this as satanic no sense of well you know the organizers at first claimed well we want to be inclusive and this and that and um, the the poor africans and the poor south asians they're not that dumb they're saying this is out and out satanic it's out and out blasphemy you are deliberately seeking to denigrate and mock christ in the eucharist and this is evil and but for the pakistanis and the nigerians and the sudanese and other people in muslim majority countries this is another act another club to hand to the islamic fundamentalists who say christians in pakistan and nigeria and sudan are the same as christians in england or france you're all left-wing pro-gay nut jobs therefore let's kill you so this is uh ammunition uh for the radical Islamists, um, handed to them by French secularists. Yeah. Um, well, the, you know, it, it, the uh, 
it's ironic that this is what the Muslims think we are already, and then mm-hmm. we, we let the French uh, offer confirmation that, yeah, we're, we're the sick. Um, now, we had Olympics in communist countries, Russia, China, you, you can name them. They never insulted uh, Christianity, you know? I, I don't get it. Why? No, they just arrest and kill Christians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Well, I'm just saying they, they don't blaspheme uh, our Eucharist on, in an opening ceremony. So, <sighs> uh, The Vatican finally released a communique from the Vatican Press Office, mm-hmm. which in very tepid say, oh, my, this is a nice, not a nice thing. We like nice things. Va- Catholic conservatives have been livid at the lack of... Uh, alacrity in which the Catholic, the Vatican responded. The French bishops out of the box were caught, were denouncing this, but Francis and company held their fire. And the criticism from Catholic traditionalists is that it's just another Vatican trying to see who says something to make sure we're not on the wrong side, that we don't say something that people we don't like also say. So the, this is like the, uh, the, you remember the Pachamama thing where the mm-hmm. uh, uh, Indi- uh, Native American goddess, uh, Amazonian goddess, was pretended to be the Virgin Mary and they at Rome and all this and that? And the Vatican, you know, was fine with that until the world blo- still conservative blow up. And Catholic conservatives are saying, look, the Vatican still hasn't learned its lesson. Um, this is, you know, writ large what happened on the banks of the Tiber in Rome with a little Indian statue, uh, well, a tableau of wickedness and depravity. Sometime in, I think it was the 1970s, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, most major denominations, and the evangelical wing decided that it would be helpful in their desire to save the world if liberals loved them. You know, if the press loved them, if, you know, if I could just get some respect on the front page of the New York Times, um, I could grow the church faster. And this is what the Vatican does is, well, they, they don't want to really put out a statement that's going to offend the liberals, you know, who love this kind of thing. I don't want to aff- offend the, the French because we remember the, the, uh, the French Revolution. They're, they're going to chop off our heads again. So I don't know. I, I, I don't get the Vatican in this. And and more, some people have really dug, done a deep dive into this whole thing and looking at all the images and looking at it closely, and a lot of thought went into what was presented. Mm-hmm. And stuff that didn't, you know, for foreigners or for non-French people wouldn't immediately jump out at them. But, you know, at one point, uh, there's a bookshelf and somebody takes out three books and you see the titles of the book. If you don't speak French or you know French literature, you don't know. The books were all books about sexuality, and one of them was a book that celebrated pedophilia. Mm-hmm. Um, you've, if you look closely, you see a man, man's genitals next to the blue uh, Dionysian goddess, God, and you know, God, who people said, "Oh, well, that's what we're repenting," has is not ever painted blue in Greek art or literature or anything like that. Who is? The Hindu gods, that's the color of, uh, you know, the Kama Sutra, you know, that's right. sorts of stuff. This is just, the deeper and deeper you get into this, the more aggressively blas satanic it is. And, of course, who is still silent? No, 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 no. There's no way uh, Justin will be silent here. I think, and this may be a conspiracy, that Twitter just blocked his account because he's normally pretty up on what's going on around the world. He's usually first to say something without thinking on Twitter. So Elon Musk has clearly blocked Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. It's the only explanation for his silence in all this, George. Right? You're, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Okay. Justin Welby <laughs> has kept his mouth shut and has been left to a liberal bishop, the Bishop of Worcester, John Inge, yep. and the uh, flying one of the flying Catholic bishops, Paul Thomas, the Bishop of Oestre, to put out very strong, strong statements. Even the Free Church of England's Primus has put out a statement denouncing this. Um, but is the, the Church of England bishops, they're, 
they're otherwise engaged. Well, yes, but I want to go back to the statement I made a minute ago that uh, denominations really desire to have liberals love them. And I think mm -hmm. the poster child for that currently is Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who would love to be loved by the world as he grows the church. Uh, Welby busy with other statements of outrage. He was outraged this week. I did see him call for Israel to leave the honor. Well, I'm reading that. Did you write this sentence here? He calls for Israel to leave honor the year. Okay. So basically, the International Court of Justice has advised, in an opinion, that Israel occupies parts of the West Bank they shouldn't, and they need to get out ASAP. And Justin Welby said, "Here, here." Now, the International Court of Justice is a left-wing joke. It's not recognized taken seriously in the United States. British government historically has not recognized taken seriously what it says. Um, it has the import of, let's say, the uh, Columbia Student Union, uh, Columbia University Student Union, if they put out a statement on Israel. We know exactly in advance what it's going to say. It's going to be anti Semitic sure. and nonsensical. Um, but Justin Welby is fine in quoting this uh, frankly disreputable outfit with a history of anti-Semitism. Um, see, many of these international, like the, uh, like the UN's uh, human rights or religious freedom, well, you know, North Korea and uh, Cuba are on those commissions in Iran, you know, promoting religious freedom. Yeah, 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 that's a real one. Uh, how that the labor government in Britain has now introduced an arms embargo against Israel just in time for a war that may start today while we're filming between Israel and Iran. Weapons that Israel has purchased and contracts are not going to be honored, the new foreign secretary says, until they're finishing investigation claims by nut jobs like the ICJ that Israel committed genocide in Gaza. So there's a quiet, the kooks have uh, taken over the British government. Now, this can be said on many levels, but uh, in foreign policy, we're seeing that happen now. Yeah, I mean, I, I just quickly uh, Googled who is on the the board. There are 15 judges that are part of the uh, uh, this little thing we're talking about, and the judges hail from Somalia, Uganda, Morocco, China, Japan, Lebanon, a, a victim of its own civil war with a... Uh, allowing too many uh, mig Im illegal immigrants in. Russia, Slovakia, it's getting better. Brazil, Jamaica, France, France, we just talked. I mean, the list of people who are on this this little uh, uh, international forum uh, that's judging Israel, it is a joke. And you always have to go and, and take a step further and, and look at what's going on. And uh, I'm hoping to have an interview this week with David Polygli. Uh, it would be nice to get a pre and post war uh, World War Three interview with him and talk about what's going on. So it's it's a mess over there, George and uh, Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, is not helping. Oh, we get to return. I, I, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just one you, Kevin, you made a very powerful point that Justin Welby seeks the praise of the left, mm -hmm. um, and he does everything he can to sort of. You know, support their narrative, and uh, we'll get into what he's doing with the riots in a little bit. But the difference is, someone like Catherine Jeffords Shorey didn't have to please the left because they recognized her as one of her own, one of their own. Yes. Whereas Welby is, they're deeply suspicious because he's an old Etonian and went to Cambridge and he came out of Holy Trinity, Brompton, and he wrote a book and, that was very anti-LGBTQ, yeah. and so that. He is trying to basically switch sides. And in doing so, he has alienated his old friends, his base. And the left is happy with what he does, but they will never, ever give him a break. Mm -hmm. um, what we say about Welby is actually rather mild compared to what some gay activists in the Church of England amongst the clergy, Charlie Bell, what we say is nothing about Welby compared to what they say. Mm -hmm. 
So and, it will be. It's a fool. It's a fool's errand. He's never going to achieve what he hopes to by these sort of nonsensical public utterances. Well, he he promised to keep the Anglican Church together. Uh, that didn't happen, um, and that was his main goal. And you can't switch sides while performing your duties and expect uh, to maintain a peaceful unity within the Anglican Communion. George, uh, now we have lots. Can, yeah. can we say, though, that he has achieved his goal of unity because everybody unites around the fact that they hate him? <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah. The dislike for Archbishop Justin Welby has unified, uh, you know, enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Okay, George, according to YouTube, our audience represents is represented 38% by uh, viewers from the UK. And I would expect most of them are Church of England uh, attendees. And because we have such a large audience from the UK and because they don't have a free press or a freedom of speech, we sometimes have to explain what's happening in the country. And today is going to be no different. Uh, you have riots breaking out in different cities uh, around uh, England, uh, Birmingham, uh, uh, Manchester, parts of London, and I thought we we could talk a little bit about this on the show because, well, it's Anglican Communion, and it's Church of England, and we are the Anglican Unscripted, George. The UK is exploding with violent protests over a topic we covered in our last episode, an attack by a uh, young man on three girls, killing them and injuring nine others. Why on earth would the UK be exploding? Well, the Prime Minister blames uh, right-wing race thugs. Uh, he's blaming Elon Musk for allowing Twitter to broadcast videos of riots, uh, mobs of Muslim men shouting Allah Akbar, brandishing machetes mm -hmm. in Bolton and Middlesbrough and Stoke and Southport and Bristol, and the police standing idly by. Um, of videos of uh, crowds of Muslim men beating up, you know, individual whites they happen to encounter. Um, because the government is saying the violence is all, should, is all going one way. It's white violence against the immigrants and the uh, non and Muslim, people of Muslim descent. And if, if, if you don't watch Twitter, you won't know this from watching the Sky News or the BBC. Mm -hmm. Sky News uh, has a little thing where they talked about, they showed like a, a mob burning a taxi. And then as a Muslim mob appeared and, you know, slashed the tires of their van, they cut away quickly because they only, they only seem to be able to show one side of the violence. Um, the violence is not due to poor, dumb people being influenced by uh, Nigel Farage or Tommy Robinson or George or Kevin or Calvin or Gavin and all these people. We're talking about 30 years of the government uh, hostility towards its own people. We have the Muslim rape culture. Uh, we have riots in Rotherham where I think, correct people correct me in comments, but I think 1,600 young girls over the past 20 odd years mm -hmm. were raped by Muslim grooming gangs and the police did nothing. Um, there's, you know, immigration, there are not enough housing, hospitals, you know, everything is being, you, England, the, the English people are losing England, the culture of England, the essence of England is being replaced. And if you actually about to listen to read and read what these uh, leaders of the Muslim Defense League and whatnot said they are quite clear they seek to make Islam, Islam the religion of Britain. Mm -hmm. They seek to either convert or drive out, and it's unspoken, or kill those who don't believe and support them. Yeah. And the government, it has a two-tiered system. Uh, you can have, you know, there have been on Twitter, X, there are videos of a British policeman saying to a Muslim group armed with machetes, we're here to protect you. And then you see British policemen uh, breaking into houses, searching for people, not having probable cause, but they've been told to go crack down by the government. The government, you know, Yvette Cooper, the uh, uh, Home Secretary, um, 
has been on this thing where we need to get rid of all, empty the prisons of all these people. And now she says, we have plenty of space now to uh, uh, jail people who have expressed political dissent. So 70-year-old ladies uh, pulled out of the crowds, men assaulted by the police who haven't done anything. It's all on video. There's a two-tier justice system. It's almost like you guys lost the war. You lost the war and you've been allowed a, a, uh, a foreign entity to, to occupy you, to spoil you, to rape you. You're paying for this, British people. Your taxes support this government and support these immigrants, and you have no say in the matter. Nobody asked no. you whether you want yeah. this. I think the desire and the understanding of conservatives and liberals uh, alike is that when people come to our country to migrate in, they we understand that they want to assimilate. They I, And I see this all the time. When, when a person goes through the legal migration system into America to become a worker or a student and they become a citizen, they, they take the oath, these people love America. They came here mm -hmm. to be to assimilate into the best part of America. Now, the people who are crossing our border illegally, some of them do desire that. Some desire to start a business here or to, to get a job here that they couldn't get in the country that they're fleeing from. Some are indeed fleeing persecution. However, to assume that uh, mass immigration is going to cause assimilation is incorrect. That's been proven mm -hmm. through history. Uh, recent history and in long-term history, that um, uh, vol the large volume of immigration reduces the ability of uh, assimilation. And L England, UK, is a wonderful place to, 30 years ago, to assimilate to. It was a, uh, uh, a wonderful country. It was a, a leader in the West. It had cultural significance around the world, and it was looked up to. That has changed so drastically, George. Um, We're in a, uh, one of the most striking photos I saw, and I used it with an article I published, or a, a statement I published, was taken in Belfast, where IRA, Catholic IRA supporters, marching arm in arm with Ulster Protestant Unionists, with the Irish Tricolor and the Union Jack, standing shoulder to shoulder, united on an issue. This has not happened since the Irish Civil War in yeah. 1920. Since the okay? Peace yeah, I know. Uh, this is, you know, this is, this is unprecedented. And their opponents are Antifa and Muslim immigrants. They're protesting in Belfast. Muslim immigration, and they're met by counter-protests from the left and Islam. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Church of Ireland bishops of Belfast issued a statement that basically was worthless, useless. They missed the moment. Justin Welby has backed the government in the condemnation of anti-immigrant violence, but is silent about Muslim violence. Mm -hmm. Welby's an ally of the Prime Minister. And I've seen a half dozen statements from bishops of the Church of England voicing these either at the best, it's why can't we all get along, but at the worst, it's these white thugs uh, who are causing all this problem. There's, and I contrast this. Do you remember uh, Black Lives Matter riots? We had them in the U.S. And they had yeah, them in Britain. Had them in, yeah. Go ahead. And the liberal elites, the press, the media, the government, the bishops of the Church of England, uh, during the BLM riots, they called for understanding and recognition of the grievances that the rioters were showing. Burning down a shop was uh, a consequence of a corrupt capitalist system. Now, riots are evil. So, in 2020, riots are okay when foreigners or non-white people do it, but when British people, uh, Native English people, Irish people, Welsh, Scots do it, it's evil. So this, and you know, this two-tier system of morals of justice, when you close every door, so that there's no counter voice being heard, um, except on uh, obscure outlets 
uh, on Twitter or in the internet or social media, um, you will create the uh, situation where violence is inevitable. Yeah. Um, no. And I'm not, I'm not, no, I want to say this so that people don't beat me up in this. I am not condoning violence. I don't think violence should happen. I don't want there to be violence. But the way the system has worked so far, violence is the only way out. And that's strange because, you know, I'm a big promoter of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who's his greatest uh, uh, gift to uh, civilization was nonviolent protest. We can do this by showing you beating us up and people will learn how bad the system is. And, you know, uh, I, I, I agree with his uh, ability to show that. Uh, people were bigoted and evil in that time and he demonstrated that and the world has changed for good in many ways and some in bad ways. I want to back up and talk a little bit about um, what happens when people see something wrong that they can't change happening in their country and that's patriotism. We're watching up here and people saying no this is not going to happen on the shores of the UK. We're not going to let this happen anymore. We had that happen here in America. On 9-12-01, the day after 9-11, people who had kind of been at war politically for the longest time in a country of uh, the melting pot of America woke up and, and brushed off the dust and said, no, how dare you? And we became a, a patriotic country that loved America again for 20 years. It's wearing off now, but there's there's a time in place where it's good to be a patriot for your country, to have that understanding that uh, it, it's good to love something good about your country. And I think uh, the UK is starting to, to come around and we'll see what happens in Britain in the next couple of weeks, uh, if they can have a groundswell. I don't think, I, I'm not as optimistic as you are. Um, I'm optimist. I hate to say that. Yeah. Uh, two, two little vignettes. When I was in high school, I went away to a boarding school. Mm -hmm. And I had two friends, two classmates, uh, Eric Chaumont. Eric was a French boy and poor kid. When he came, he was teased mercilessly because he had short, he wore short pants. Uh, but Eric came from the island of St. Bartholomew, St. Barts. Okay, sure. In the Caribbean. But Eric had been born in Algiers. And his family, his French family had lived in Algeria for almost a hundred years. And his father had a very seriously successful businesses. And about two or three million Frenchmen were forced out of Algiers when de Gaulle stopped yeah. supporting the French minority in Algeria. So in my lifetime, we've had massive population transfers because the Muslims and the Christians, the Algerians and the French could not live together in one place. And so the French almost all had to leave Algeria. The other boy I'm thinking of was, an, it was a boy from what was then called Rhodesia. And his father sent him to an American boarding school with the foreknowledge that he could not come back to his country and he'd rather have his son have a future in the United States. And we saw a quarter of a million people of English ancestry basically driven out of Rhodesia. After the Second World War, all of the Germans in uh, and Hungarians in Czechoslovakia were driven out of that country. All the Germans out of uh, what is now Western Poland, Western, yeah. Yeah. all the Poles of now what is Belarus. There have been massive, massive population transfers in the last hundred years because the consequence was death for those who didn't st who didn't leave. And with the government so obtuse and so corrupt and so evil and hating its own people the way it does, unless there's an Algeria solution, I don't see any way forward um, in political or sociological terms. Immigration unchecked where people are allowed to bring their culture with them rather than assimilating into the new culture is a recipe for death. See, Britain is committing suicide. It's committing suicide and it may be too late. It might be. Maybe. I am, truth be told, I am more optimistic than George. 
Same. Well, one one thing I want to mention is that people some sometimes say, "Well, is it even moral to protest? Absolutely. Is it moral to burn down a, a, a migrants' hotel?" Well, I think violence is wrong, and I wouldn't burn down a hotel. But mm. we have to understand that in our Anglican tradition, revolution has always been applauded. What? But George, you're a nut job. You can't say that. Well, yes, you're I an can. American. You're a anti-colonist. <laughs> In the American Revolution, mm -hmm. there, you know, the question was theologically raised, is it right to take up arms against king and country mm -hmm. uh, if you're an American patriot? And the uh, man named Richard Watson, who was the Regis Professor of Divinity at the time, he later became Bishop of Landef, Flandef in Wales, Flandef, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wrote a book where he condemned the politics that led the colonists to want to leave the British Empire. But he went on to say that they had a moral obligation and duty to do so. And one little phrase I copied down just so I could trot it out, that those who share in the cultural and heritage of British liberties will not degenerate from the blood of their ancestors, but with united hands and hearts drag forth to consign punishment the most pestilent of all traitors, the traitors against the Constitution and the common safety. So that statement, though we wouldn't have blood of our ancestors, could be said today. Who are the traitors to the Constitution of Britain and the public safety, the common safety? It's the elites. And there is a moral case to be made for standing against them. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm okay, George and I are not experts on the UK. Uh, but I, I don't hear anything coming from the royals. Should I be worried? Well, do you include Meghan Markle? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, she's anti-royal. I mean, uh, the, are, are, are they just watching the BBC? Do they have no idea what's happening in the country? Um, yeah, why am I backing up and taking a bigger approach here? Uh, in my study of history, it's my understanding or uh, what I tell people is that uh, socialism can only exist when there is a, a complicit press and communism can only exist when there's a complicit church and here we have the structure of both happening at the same time in the UK um, and uh, a fall of a country can only happen when you have both complicits. Well, Kevin, I, I think from a political point of view or PR point of view, the best thing the royal family could do, given all the nonsense and things that have happened over the past decades, is for King Charles to summon the Prime Minister to Buckingham <laughs> Palace and say, uh -huh. what are you up to? Yeah. I mean, and for Prince William to make some statements affirming the liberties of British men and women. Doesn't mean he has to join a riot, but if he basically gives somebody if the if the royal family gives voice to the concerns of the oppressed majority this will be a win-win for them but are they smart enough to do that i don't know i don't know i, I know they're talking about it uh, you know darn well that you know what do we do you know I, well i don't want to be ransacked don't want that king don't want no ransom but i mean the, here we are we have liberal elites running amok um, and one of the big fashions they had this last half century is to make uh, majority people, white people, feel like they are um, uh, the bad, the, the worst part of the world. And they should be guilty because they're privileged. And in that, and you see this right now in the UK, um, you have no rights because you are the white man trying to uh, come against these protests. How dare you? Let the minority Muslims have their way for a while. Can't you, can't you let them just have their way? And we will see how that works out. Well, um, today the Kamala Harris is, uh, or Kamala, I never know how to say it, is going to pick a vice presidential candidate. But she did. And over the weekend, she did. She did. Oh, yeah. And, and as a uh, um, native Minnesotan. Well, and a native. Did she pick the guy from Minnesota? Yeah, Tim Walls is going to be oh. her running mate. Now, she is genius. 
Okay, you always want to pick the dumbest dumb person who will never overshadow you when you're president. Biden did. And so she's just like, hey, I, who's the dumbest but dumb person I could? How about the guy who caused the Minneapolis riots? The BLM? Let's pick him. Let, let, well, he, uh, before, yeah, go ahead. Well, what I, this weekend on one of the t- chat shows, Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the liberal, one of the liberal networks. I think it was MSNBC. One of the commentators said he didn't think that they would pick the governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, because that would put f- three out of the four people in the White House were Jews. Yeah. Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff, is Jewish. Shapiro is Jewish, and his wife is Jewish. And I'm thinking, this is the United States, and we're saying we got two. The left is concerned that there are going to be too many Jews in the White House. Um, in the, in the, uh, well, we've different world. Yeah, it is. All right. Um, let's. Okay. Surprised. I don't know what happened here, but we reported on Venezuela. Um, kind of proof in the pudding that you can elect socialism in, but you have to fight it out with a gun. And. Uh, we had mentioned last week that the Episcopal Church, who uh, has a, uh, a diocese down there, hasn't said a word about what's going on in Venezuela. And boom, you said you, ha- you have word now from the Episcopal Church. What's going on? A, a stopped clock, as they say, is right twice a day. And credit is due where credit yeah. is due Sure. when people do good things. And the Episcopal Church has put out a statement lending its full support and moral authority to the opposition in Venezuela, which is a big deal. Now, I mean, it's not going to change anything on the ground, but it uh, good for them. Yeah. Good for them to call out injustice, to call out uh, evils of communism, uh, which is, if you really think hard about it, I this might be the first time they've i'm gonna uh, steal your line kevin you better say it no go ahead you go I'll, no I'll no go no you, kevin said this in the pre-show that would this be the first time that they uh uh denounced communism i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. it might be by accident i mean at some point communism is so easily you have to ask to be announced at some phase but um you know when i say it the, the Episcopal Church was complicit in Venezuela. You know, uh, they were part of the problem down there. So, you know, uh, I'm glad I have, they you see how bad the government is now. I have a number of Venezuelans in my congregation. Um, and I talked to them in coffee hour and I said, have you talked to your families down there? And said, most of them are middle class Venezuelans, professionals who've been able to get out and start over again in the United States. And they say their families, basically, everybody's staying in their house or their apartment. You're not going into the street because the army and the police are shooting people and or there are parts of town where the police don't want to enter because they will be attacked. Um, it's a mess down there. We don't know how it's going to end. All right, let's move on. Uh, suicide bomber at a security gate uh, in Somalia. Bomb goes off. Gunmen rush in, shoot, 40 dead. Let's talk about this, George. We don't hear about these things in the press in the United States or probably in Britain. Mm -hmm. But Al-Shabaab, which is the Islamic terrorist group in Somalia, they're the ones that did all the massacres of Kenyan Christians, Mm -hmm. you know, at the university that time and down the coast. They, uh, the Lido Beach Hotel, Mogadishu was trying to rebuild after years and years and years, decades of civil war and unpeace, and Lido Beach Hotel was the place where people in Somalia, Mogadishu, could go and have lunch by the beach at a hotel. It was sort of the most secure place in the country. There were several checkpoints you had to pass through to get in. And it was a sign of hope, well, maybe for the middle classes and upper classes of Mogadishu and this very small Christian population is there. Well, this past weekend, a suicide bomber uh, detonated the bomb at the main security gate, taking it out, and then all these gunmen rushed in and they shot everybody they could find. 40 people were murdered. And then Al-Shabaab basically released a statement. And these are the same people who are the pirates uh, and 
they may not be Shabab, but they're all tied together. It's all one giant sort of religious criminal narco group that they want to show they can hit anybody, anytime, anywhere. And they took the most secure uh, place in Somalia to show that they can reap destruction at whim. And this is, this is the, I mean, most people murdered in Africa are not middle-class diners at beachside restaurants. They're poor villagers in the hinterlands who we hear nothing about. The uh, IDF, or is it the ALF? One of these alphabet groups in the Congo, I think they may have reported it, you know, murdered, broke into an Anglican church on a Sunday, two, three Sundays ago, shot three parishioners and kidnapped the minister. You don't hear about that in the West, but that's the reality of life in uh, the Congo and in northern Kenya and Somalia and South Sudan and parts of Nigeria, Niger. This un hard places, hard, hard places. places. All right, so let's end this with a happy story. Happy in a good way. I'll, I'll explain that as we get a story. I like think this. this story will get the most comments yes. and spark the most fighting, though. Oh, that's right. yeah. This is where the violence happens in the comments. Lutheran Orthodox joint statement on the Philic Way proceeds from the Father and the Son. Um, I'm going to give you a little backstory here. For some reason, uh, I was at a event in Texas at a certain church and I had a discussion with a certain bishop down there who was helping with the prayer book, uh, the new ACNA prayer book. And the rumors had circulated that they were gonna play with the Philoque. And I asked this bishop, he said, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do the Orthodox thing because if you haven't heard, uh, the Metropolitan Jonah is going to you know, give us you know, a, a lot of good press by uh, uh, you know, us changing. I said, yeah, okay, you're not there yet. You're a brand new start and um, uh, you can do this in the future. You can, uh, you can do this in the back of the book. You can put in the back of the book what you think the correct uh, uh, is and stuff like that. But if you're going to offer that type of change to people coming to the brand new ACNA Eucharist uh, 1 and 2 right away, it's going to cause confusion and disruption. And um, somehow this conversation, attributed to me or not, went up the chain and other bloggers at the time had influence. And from my understanding, they changed their mind on that and they said they will wait. And it looks like they've waited, George. Yeah, the loop now. This is different. This in is the Luther creed, yeah. we have yeah. in in the creed, mm -hmm. we have the statement: "Proceed the the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father." Mm -hmm. That was the original language of the creed. Yes. But then in the Western Church, I don't know the exact date, but way before the Reformation. <gasps> yes, thirty. Western <laughs> Church added and the Son. Mm -hmm. And so it proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. glorified yes. And the Orthodox have always said, hey, you cannot unilaterally change a creed unless we have another council. And in the olden days, a thousand years ago, the Catholics said, no, you know, Peter is the uh, God's vicar on earth. Mm -hmm. What? We do, everybody should do, and you Orthodox, you hairy people out in the boondocks, we don't care. Well, in the modern ecumenical movement, these issues have been readdressed. How can we get close to the Orthodox? And the Orthodox are still mad about this statement. And Calvin. So the ACNA, ACNA has experimented with putting and the sun in brackets so that you could mm -hmm. omit it. Mm -hmm. And this Lutheran uh, Orthodox sta joint statement basically agrees with the Orthodox that it was wrong for the Western Church to change the creed without cons consultation from the East. Now the problem is, theologically, the West really can't do this because of, uh, well, would for Anglicans it would yeah, violate Anglicans. the 39 Arters religion, yeah, yeah. and it's contrary to the Catholic, small c, meaning Roman Catholic and Anglican and all the churches that proceeded from them, understanding the economy of the Trinity. In other words, 
just think of it, you know, this is for confirmation class level for 12 year olds father the son jesus proceeds from the father and the holy spirit proceeds from the father and the son in other words it's not father and then father the holy spirit is one two three so we have a little triangle and the clover leaf is brought out at this point now for a deep dive into the theology of this william witt one of your early partners Absolutely. in yeah. this endeavor great has oh, written yeah. a detailed uh discussion of the anglican position on this that he gave a paper a few years ago the evangelical theological association meeting mm -hmm. where he defends the anglican position but Witt says, yes, it was done the wrong way, but it was done for the right theological reasons, according to our ecclesiology, according to our understanding of Aquinas and everybody. Yves Congar, no relation, the 20th century Dominican Catholic theologian, said there's no way to square this, the circle between the East and the West, unless we're either one is basically willing to give up their theological integrity. So we just have to agree to disagree, because this is basically a pointless thing. Now, for Episcopalians, ever since I was a child, there have been people who in church omit parts of the creed. You know, for us and for all men. And the lady down the road goes, for us and for all people. You know, she doesn't want to say all men. And there are some people who don't say, and the son. But, you know, life goes on. We're all able to agree to be in the same building, worshiping the same Lord. And sometimes there are things that we just can't fix. And trying to... I think the Lutheran move is a mistake, trying to placate the Orthodox. Yeah, admit it was done badly, but just stick to what you believe. For goodness sake, Karl Barth, um, in the Reformed tradition, Karl Barth is a massive major supporter of the Father and the Son. And, you know, it's not like it was just done to be mean and just stick an eye on the Orthodox. It's how we understand the Trinity the economy of the Trinity is a technical phrase to work. Well, and, and that's just it. The Bible and Scripture does not devote chapters describing the Trinity and how it works. We this is a uh, uh, a doctrine that developed after um, uh, the the resurrection, and so I I'm not here to offer one opinion or another. All I know is if I talk about the Trinity for more than five minutes, I've entered into heresy. Okay, I, I, I'm saying something wrong. And I leave it to a, a, some people with a higher pay grade and who wear a collar. Um, but I do look at this, this in the, the political analysis of why do you want to do this? Is it for the, the unity or because you want to change your doctrine? And that's where you need to be careful. And uh, that's why I think the ACNA taking the slow approach with the, the Philico, even though they want they want to show unity uh, with the Orthodox, um, they were wise not to do so so quickly. So, well, the wonderful thing about being an Episcopalian is that I just won't buy new prayer books if we change it, and I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. Well, now for for those who who want to, uh, I sup I I like the traditional language. But then again, I don't think George Floyd was murdered. I believe there are only two sexes. I don't believe in man-made climate change. I don't believe the earth is going to be destroyed in the next five years and the polar bears are all drowning. Uh, I hold every unpopular, politically incorrect view that you can hold, and I guess this is just another one of them. Oh, this, does, no, this isn't even in the top 10 of the, the worst uh, conspiracies you probably believe in, George. Um, and, but that's the reality. We get to do, you know, because we live in a freer country than any other country uh, on earth, we are allowed to have these open discussions and uh, make statements that we're willing to defend. In England, you uh, risk offending the person, and that will put you in jail over the weekend um, and, and give you a court date. Uh, I, I feel so sorry for what's happening over there right now in, in watching this in a modern 21st century uh, w 
what was once a, a wonderful demo, uh, well, not Democrat, but uh, a wonderful free country. Not so much anymore, George. I think we've covered all the stories. Let me go look here. Uh, I'm getting texts from people saying, are you done recording yet? Are you done recording yet? Which means we went long. I just need to check the list here. We got it all. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching Anglican Unscripted. I've forgotten the episode 873. <laughs>